Just for the listeners out there, we got Mitch Mustang today, and he was the 2006 Player of the Year, number one QB in the nation, coming out of high school, over the likes of Tim Tebow and Matthew Stafford, started in the Army Bowl, went on to go 8-0 as a starter at Arkansas, moved on to USC, uh, played minor league baseball, now as as a pilot, firefighter, you name it fascinating guy so we're going to get into all that today um, so bef- before uh, we got on here we, we got to talk a little bit about his fire career and so he spent the last what 10 years out in Arizona uh, working on uh, what he, how was that called it's not pure his rims the rims teams yes yeah, so we spent the past, past four uh, seasons fire seasons on the rims teams doing rapid extraction modules so high angle vertical rescue uh, helicopter operations. We're just kind of a standby force. You know, we get assigned to um, to a division on a fire, and uh, essentially do a lot of training and a lot of working out and a lot of sitting around. You know, hurry up and wait. So that's pretty much it. May do it this season. We'll see how it shakes out. But just finished my commercial pilot training and and kind of venturing down that path now. Very cool, man. Um, is there <laughs> any crossover to where you can be a pilot within the fire realm there? There would be eventually. I mean, there's no direct correlation to it. That's a whole separate side. The aviation side of the wildland fires are, are a whole separate side. They require a lot of hours. Generally, they'll require, you know, a very high number, or I should say a relatively high number of tailwheel time, mountain flying, low-level flying. So if you were to, to go into, like I say, a crop dusting career uh, pretty early on, if you were to train on tail draggers and, and get those hours for insurance purposes and then go into crop dusting, that'd be a pretty good pathway. Or okay. if you have some sort of previous military time, you know, a lot of guys who are rotor wing, uh, helicopter guys, you know, through the military, obviously they, they have a lot of that time. So it's not a direct path. It would be, you know, a number of years before I did that. And there's some cool stuff. There's, there's really, it's a really neat world if you get into the aviation asset side of, of wildland fires. But yeah, I, that's not something I'm at looking at right now. But, uh, you know, again, I'm a long way from even being able to consider that. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so you're just getting your feet wet, you get getting uh, your commercial license and just see where it goes kind of thing right now, huh? Yeah, I'm just now hitting about 400 hours. Um, you know, you oh, need 1,500 nice. to be, uh, uh, you know, part 121, so an airline, what people think of when they think of commercial aviation. Yeah. Uh, so very early in it, um, just now getting getting my foot dipped in that, right? So it'll go pretty quick from this point on, but to get that first 350, 400 it takes a, a fair amount of time and, and effort. Oh, yeah. It's, it's pricey too. I know a lot of guys like my neighbor, um, he's not military. So what he does is he, he teaches and so he instructs. So he gets a lot of hours that way, but I got a lot of buddies that within the air force there. Well, the, the big problem is, is even in the guard reserve, which is what I do now is you need, you need full timers. A lot of these pilots, you know, they get their licensing and they get all these hours built up and they get very skilled and they can do a lot more on the outside. And so, Yep. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to even keep in. I mean, because they're officers, so it's hard to keep in even you know lieutenant colonels and stuff because the you know over time the amount of money you're going to make as a commercial pilot it's, it's pretty good and retirement. Yeah, it's wise. not even it's not even comparable. And you could get in. I mean, you could have an all day. You could have a a we a month's discussion of of the problems with the military, right? And the retention yeah. and, and and the issues they have there. It's uh yeah, the, the Air Force has big problems, and one of them is certainly keeping pilots and. With the airlines being what they are now, or even I mean, even if you're flying Part 91 or 135, and then come out and earn, you, know, you can work part time essentially, work 15 days a month and make several hundred thousand dollars. I mean, even your pension with the military isn't going to touch that over 10, 20 years. So, yeah, it's it's a problem I can sympathize with. I mean, I know quite a few guys who fly military, and it, it's the incentive is for them to get out, to not be active duty, uh, to fly guard or reserve, and and you know they get the best of both worlds, right? So. They get all the training, they get the fast jet time, they get to do all the cool stuff that everybody else gets Ooh. to do, and probably a little bit even nicer than being active duty in a lot of ways. Maybe a little more There's liberal on the rules. Yeah, a lot of freedom on the reserve and guard side that you don't have active duty. 
um, at least from what you know what I can glean from it, just talking to guys I know. So anyway, DOD's got a real problem on their hands as as uh, flying goes. I mean, it is a sad world when guys are jumping ship from flying some of the coolest stuff you can imagine, right? We all grew up wanting to fly. If you were if you grew up wanting to fly, which I did, you know, you grew up wanting to fly all the cool stuff. And I know guys who can't get out fast enough. So not to get stuck down that rabbit hole, but I, I think it's speaks to the problems yeah, that DOD has right now. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good point to bring up is you can fly, I mean, some very high dollar, very fun aircraft, but, but yeah, they're jumping shit. And, and not to get further down rabbit hole, but there's a new retirement plan. That's more of a uh, 401k almost versus the, uh, the 20 year plan. Like, like back in the day what we were doing and that's that's another big problem so the like leadership core that mid-range core of you've got brand new and you've got people that are staying in for for the long haul and that middle range yep. that that leader that's really doing a lot of the leading they're they're taking off man so especially the pilot. yeah yep but, but no, it's really cool that you've seemed to have gotten to live you know live out a lot of awesome dreams you know a lot of people that set goals and say oh, i want to do this that and, you know a lot of times there's a very small percentage of people that get to do those things and man you, you've gotten to do sounds like all of those things so kudos to you on that man that's awesome yeah i appreciate it it's been a lot of fun i you know i i look up and i wonder what i've been doing the last 10 12 years 15 years <laughs> and certainly a lot i'm sure a lot of people do you know, there's, there's pros and cons to both, right? I mean, I, I've got a lot of friends who took the traditional route and set a career when they were 22, 23, and so got married, had kids, and did the, you know, suburban dad route, and, and there's a lot to envy in that, and I've been kind of the opposite. I've bounced around. I've, I've spent years in a trauma center. I spent years at a firefighter training center doing command training, uh, running supply chain for a large body armor company before I went back to medical contracting and, and the wildland fires and flying and things like that, so it's been fun to get a you know a broad skill set the people i've been able to meet and kind of glean a little bit of the reality as it were uh, that i wouldn't have had otherwise right if i'd have stayed and, and and maybe done one track so but it's a trade off i mean it's you're on the road a lot you're gone a lot um the summers i mean it's it's glorified camping which is fun but you'll spend 3 4 months of the year sleeping in a tent when it's you know 35 degrees in the morning and 87 degrees in the afternoon and it's, it can grow, it can grow fairly tiresome, but it's a lot of fun. Um, it's challenging. You know, if you're the type who, who really doesn't want to know what you're doing from day to day and where you're going to be, it's a, it's a good life, um, at least for a little bit and kind of get to get a, get to glance into other worlds, right? We work a lot with the national forest, the BLM, uh, with hotshot teams, with, with smoke jumper teams. I mean, you'll get to see every single aspect. That's just the fire side, right? But if you want to do municipal fire, whatever, I mean, you'll get to talk to so many people and kind of get an idea of what, what's going on. And if that's something you're looking for, where you fit in, I tell young guys, I mean, certainly if you're not the type to come out of high school and go to college right away, which you know, obviously I took a different route with sports. You don't have a lot of choice with that, but I, I would have considered myself one of those guys, right? I, I, I was not cut for college early on. If you're 18, 19, 20, and you're not really sure what you're doing, go get on a hotshot team, go get on a fire crew, you know, work an engine crew for a couple of summers and, uh, you know, really push yourself out there and you'll kind of get an idea of, I think one, what, you know, what realities are out there and what you can and go down and, and you can make a good career of it if you wanted to, if nothing else, it just gives you, you know, a good amount of change in your pocket and a little bit of work for the summer. And, and uh, you know, you're going to earn every dollar of it and it's going to suck for a little bit, but uh, I know a lot of guys who you know cut their teeth, so to speak on that and decided a route from that point and got to meet a lot of really cool people. Cause you'll meet people with, really expansive skill sets from all over the place, right? I mean, we're talking yeah. guys who were from a prison crew on an engine team to the aviation side, like we talked about a little bit, which is totally different to the medical side. You'll get to talk to so many different people and guys who are, you know, battalion chiefs on, on large Metro fire departments and just make those contacts and get to kind of dig your feet in. So I don't know where I'm going down that rabbit hole there, but you know, there's, there's a lot it, you can, there's a lot you can take from that. You know, I tell you, like I said, I tell young guys for sure, if you're lost and you're not really sure what you want to do, go, Go hop on one of those and just, you know, put your foot in, so to speak, and have fun hiking around and digging holes and <laughs> and meeting people. So it's a cool world. Yeah, I mean, it sounds very similar to the military lifestyle. And and honestly, a similar suggestion I would have for people that are coming out of high school that don't really know what they want to do. And I admit, it's, it's very hard to have a head on your shoulders that's like, 
man, I got this, I'm going to do this whenever you're just coming out of high school. And I was that way. And so that's why I, I just wanted to be on my own, but didn't have money. And so I was like, I'm, I'm going to the military, which turned out to be the best thing that could have ever been for me and just gets you, gets you right, you know? And, uh, but yeah, it sounds like a similar path and it's, it's honestly a path that I don't think people realize that much on. And so, yeah, it's good to, I think, get that out there, man. Yeah. I know a lot of guys who, who took the path, you know, went from wildland to, to the military. And I don't think it's a bad path. I would tell guys, you know, you know, a lot of my friends are, are either current military, former, whatever it may be, which, you know, everybody knows somebody that seems, but um, the art reserve probably get a lot of those. Yeah, guys, I so. mean, I, I would use the military like I would use college, right? It's a, it's a chance to network. It's a chance to to make contacts. You know, if you look around, there are a lot. I mean, I've, I've got friends who, you know, spent four years in the Marine Corps, you know, as an infantryman, a buddy of mine who's an infantryman and then pulled some security service, some, you know, with the diplomatic security. And now he's working in the White House and it's just on contacts he made, you know, in, in legitimately three and a half to four years in the Marine Corps. And so, you know, I just tell guys, be smart, right? Meet people, don't be a shithead, do your job and, and it'll take you a lot of places, right? And that's, again, if you're lost, just go do something, I guess is the point, right? If it's if it's the military, just go somewhere where they'll give you a job to do and you can kind of find your way from there. But yeah, I tell them too, go to the doctor every time something hurts, get your disability when you come out, have them pay for your school, you know, take advantage of everything every dime they'll give you. I mean, you can live a pretty good life off of that. Yeah, that's something that, yeah, especially military people document everything, man. Like everything. Something happens, go get checked out. I would document because a lot of times we don't want to be like, oh, I made it hurts, maybe it'd be all right. You know, especially when you're young, you know, like, yeah, a couple weeks up, you all good, but. You yeah, to I tell the young it. guys, you know, I know so many guys who are 100% disability. And, and I mean, it's not, you know, you're going to get rich off it, but man, that, that pays your mortgage, it pays your bills and your, your car payment, whatever else you want to do, and allows you to go do the things you really want without having to worry. You know, and a, as an athlete, as a contrast, you know, we don't have that sort of system. And certainly the risks are lower in a lot of ways, but you're talking about, I mean, the, the trade-off is your body, right? You're, you're trading your prime years and your physical, your physical capabilities and the risk of injury. Man, take advantage of that. I mean, damn, if, if the leagues, if, if college football would have offered a uh, pension plan coming out, I'd certainly take it, uh, or, you know, a medical disability plan, because you're going to get hurt, you're going to you're gonna have these things, so, you know, and then take advantage of the GI Bill, I mean, so many guys who aren't doing that, you know, are just letting that stuff kind of waste oh, away, especially the, the post 9-11 stuff is, is remarkable, um, you know, go do that, and uh, if nothing else, just get your BAH out of it, and <laughs> go, yeah. go get a master's <laughs> degree somewhere, and like, have them you know, dude, go do anything, right? I've got a buddy who's going, he said, uh, he's going to New York and doing a two years master's in, in photography <laughs> off of his, uh, off his post 9-11 GI and like, why not, man? Hell yeah. So dude, anyway, I definitely tell guys, take advantage of that stuff. Yeah. So I was going to say to that, I, I wasn't really mature enough when I came to high school to do mm -hmm. college and do it right. But yep. then whenever I hit that point, I used my GI bill back. I, I got like teacher's license, uh, MBA and um, a tech degree too. So I made it to where I, I could be, I could do different things, even though yep. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do now. But, uh, but yeah, and it's, you, you absolutely need to use that because it can get you, it can give you money to get by and things like that. And you're going to just put yourself, make yourself more employable and things yeah, like I mean, that. I think people they think too much of a degree program. And, and the fact is, I mean, now it's, it's a bar to entry, right? I mean, it's just, you just got to clear the hurdle. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, like I said, it just gives you time. And if somebody's going to take care of it, take advantage of that stuff. I mean, too many guys who do not take advantage of it. So, but you can say that about anything, but anyway, yeah, yeah, that's where it's at. So, you know, for the young guys out there, wild and fire is a, it's a lot of fun. It's a, a lot of stupid work, but it's uh, it's not a bad world to be in. Oh, yeah. And let's, let's take it back to high school. So, Paint the picture. You're in high school. You're on your way to winning a state championship. You are the number one ranked quarterback in the nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I remember right, you're, the the city you lived in had a Mitch Mustang day for you while you were still in high school. Is that is, was that right? Yeah, it was, right? It, was, yeah. it was. uh I think it was the day I got. I don't know if it was Gatorade or Parade. One of the two, and I, I I didn't even know these things existed honestly until they called. So it's it's not something that that I was chasing. Certainly, uh, really? and it was a one time day. People seem to think it's a recurring date. It's not. 
Okay. So, and and I wasn't even in town for it. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were bummed out about that. They're like, oh, where is he at? Yeah. Oh, I was there. For the, the I was vacation. there for the morning. Uh, I was there for the morning assembly or whatever it was in the gym, and then we left and actually went to New York for a photo shoot. So, yeah, it was it was there's a lot made of it more than it than it was really worth. I'm sure. Well, I mean, Arkansas. Even though you were in one of the bigger, you were at one of the bigger schools at Springdale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So. Even though you're at one of the bigger schools, every town, I mean, most of these towns are pretty small. So when something big happens, everybody, want, you know, they, they want to celebrate that. But sure. how was it being a high school student and having all that going on? Granted, this is before social media really took off. Mm -hmm. So that would have added, I mean, it would have been even crazier for you if that had been. But how did you navigate that as a high school kid, trying to keep a good head on your shoulders? And it's just, I mean you're like basically a celebrity in high school how, how do you how do you deal with that or yeah, how did you navigate I, you know, it I should say yeah both good and bad I you know certainly it was before you know Facebook Instagram and that sort of thing uh Twitter at that time it was like chat boards were a big thing but I will say I was very fortunate in a lot of ways to have I had a lot of really good grounding around me and that's a big part I mean, people were you know they envision like uh you know pick a pick a movie like you know, one of the high school football movies. And that's not what it was like. I mean, Springdale was, yeah. was Springdale's never really like that. It certainly wasn't then. It's not now. I had Lloyd Phillips as a, as an assistant principal. If anybody knows that name, he was a defensive lineman, all American defensive lineman for the 64 Arkansas team. And so, you know, at the time I was kind of right on the front edge. I mean, 0405 was kind of really was the first couple of years, few years, maybe of, the big like rivals and things like that or whatever they are now. Right. I mean, yeah. they're all, they're all affiliated, but at the time there was maybe three or four big of social media networks as we would consider it. And they were pretty new and this sort of thing was, was just coming on. So I don't know that we realized it at the time, what exactly was happening. Cause we were the experiment, so to speak. So every time something happened, every time we went to a tournament, every time, you know, an offer came in and, and, and this thing just kept growing, it was, there, there was no expectation as to what would happen at that point because it didn't exist. Um, it was just yeah. happening as we went through it. So that was unique. But again, I was, I was fortunate, you know, Gus was a good, a good influence in terms of keeping focus and keeping the attention to a minimum as it were, uh, or at least, nice. you know, intention coming in, but not so much attention and effort going out. You know, if you look back, it wasn't, it wasn't like we were traveling around the country and doing exposés and, and things like that. And then, like I said, Lloyd Phillips was a good influence. I mean, you know, he'd been there, done that much more so than any of us had at that point. Uh, and he was he was good at uh, keeping our heads in check. And he was a, he was absolutely an awesome, awesome guy. So and then, I mean, the rest of it was just, you know, I'm not a hyper social. You would say I'm, I'm quite aloof in a lot of ways. So for me, it was just it was business as usual. I mean, I was able to compartmentalize the game and then the the things around the game and then also school and my life beyond that it wasn't it wasn't like there's was this big confluence of I'm becoming a superstar in some way and, and maybe in some ways that would have been nice if I had a little more awareness maybe I it did myself a big favor by not being able to do that but awesome. uh, I think those factors you know those factors kind of played into it and you know really if you looked at the directly Gus was probably the biggest factor I mean we we'd had an 04 season that that ended on a relatively low note and if I'm anything, it's competitive and, and revenge and vengeance are, are uh, some pretty fun motivators for me. So we had some people that we owed we owed some payback to. And if I'm honest, I was more interested in beating the crap out of people than I was putting up stats or talking about college and that sort of thing. So, you know, the, the biggest thing for me, sports was not a dominant factor in my life. It wasn't when I was a kid. It wasn't in high school. It wasn't afterward. So. That that's probably the last factor of it. That it, it just wasn't a thought for me. I didn't really care. The idea of going to to college to play ball or going beyond that didn't really uh, sit in my head. I mean, I you know I love Troy Aikman, I love Emmitt Smith, I love the Cowboys of the '90s, but it never really dawned on me or or even entered my head that I could chase that down. And you know, as it turns out, didn't. So that made it pretty well, easy. Well, when did you realize? At what point did you realize, like, oh crap, all these offers are about to come in. Like, I gotta make a choice. Like, I guess I am going that route. What age were you when you realized that that was going down? Um, honestly, probably when I got, you know, I got that first offer from Arkansas in, in the summer of '04. 
and like anything involving that that program it was kind of a, a weird deal but that was really probably the first time i realized that this was becoming a thing i mean like, like i said for me it yeah. was the, the game for the sake of the game i enjoyed it i i mean at the time i i think i just beat out dylan adams who was a year older he was a senior to be named the starter and so I wasn't focused on college. I was focused on you know being able to play some high school games and and uh, you know not screw that up royally. So yeah, that was the first enough. time. And then once that offer came in, it kind of opened the gates. And and um, you know again we were on the cusp of a, a new era of high school sports where rivals existed and and had really people had unfettered access to more than their local team. Right. This wasn't yeah. Northwest Arkansas Times. This was rivals Arkansas and being able to keep up with what guys were doing in Florida and Georgia and, and Texas and California and be able to compare yourselves the first time directly. Right. And it was it was, I think, the uh, the elite 11 quarterback camp, which kind of started that that genre of, of uh, competitive camps was maybe a couple years old at that time, maybe a few years old. I was going to ask, was that around then? And did you did you play in that? <clears throat> yeah. So elite 11 was. Uh, out of Mission Viejo, California, uh, a couple of guys started that. And I think eventually it morphed, you know, by 2010, 2011, by the time I was finishing up college, it had morphed into really something else. You know, I had a TV yeah. series and whatnot. Same thing with the Hoover, Alabama team. We used to go to Hoover and play the seven on seven tournament and uh, beat those guys handily. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, the Elite 11 was still pretty new. I want to say it was maybe a few years old. I would have gone in 05. And I want to say it maybe started, and I mean, don't quote me on this, but maybe 02, 03. Hell, it might have been older than that. I don't know. But it was the first time it really started to get exposure. And so it was, you know, Tim Tebow and Matt Stafford and all the guys you'd mentioned oh, yeah. and a bunch of others who, again, were kind of the first series uh, of guys who went on to become big names. And I, I should say household names in college football, right? As anybody, if you talk yeah. about it. And it was the first time a group of guys had had a exposure altogether before they got to college. So. Anyway, that was all new, yeah, but the Elite 11 was still nascent then. It wasn't, there wasn't TV involved with it that I remember. Uh, there may have been like a web special, but there wasn't, you know, TV production. It was a competitive environment. I mean, that's strictly yeah. what it was. It was a week long of uh, doing drills, doing competitions at the end of it, uh, and that sort of thing. And yeah, I look back on it now and I, I had no business, you know, I, I had the talent for sure, but there were guys who had a lot more awareness and a lot more focus of, uh, you know, what they wanted and what was going on than I, than I had. Uh, so that's just what it is. Fair enough, man. So I, I know you, you played baseball at a high level too. So what, what all sports did you play in high school? Just football and baseball. I played baseball my sophomore year, I played varsity baseball my sophomore year, uh, I played football all three years. I played JV and varsity my sophomore year and then uh, varsity my junior, senior. I broke my arm in the final, in the semifinals in, in 04, my junior year. So I didn't play baseball that year, that season. Uh, I was rehabbing all that spring. And then the next season, my senior year, uh, somewhat regretfully, I'd say, I, you know, I knew I was going to college to play football and I had a scholarship yeah. to do that. And so I decided not to play baseball that spring. There wasn't a preservative aspect in hindsight. There wasn't like <laughs> You know, oh no, I'm saving myself. I don't want to get hurt. It was just like I didn't want to do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you knew what you I, were doing. Yeah, but I mean, that's I kind of wish I would have done it. But you played minor. Well, we'll get to that more here in a minute. But you played minor league baseball, but you only played what one year then in high school for baseball. Yeah, I played my sophomore year. Yep. I mean, that's. That's pretty wild, man, to be able to do that and, and take that much time off and things like that. And really, really is your second sport then, sounds like. So, yeah, it's great, a, it's great really, you start uh, at an early age, I guess. So, that's, there's that. But yeah, I mean, I played baseball since I was, you know, probably all about the same length of time. You know, I arguably early on was a better baseball player than a football player. But, yeah, I ended up playing a season of uh, minor league baseball with the White Sox and, and had, a, had a good time. Uh, but it was yeah. certainly eye-opening. I mean, it everything has become so cultured, you know, like monocultured, like baseball has its own culture and football has its own culture and, you know, golf and everything else. So it was awakening, you know, high school baseball coming up through baseball playing, you know, all through the all-star teams and travel leagues and whatnot. Um, and I was, I was dyed in the wool, right? Like everybody else. And having been out of it for at that time, I think eight years since I played when I went back, it was, I was shocked at how, how different it was than what I had remembered. So. Yeah. Do you think it maybe was good for your arm not to have been pitching that whole time? I guess you're, 
QB and you're still throwing all day times. So yeah. A lot of difference there. Well, so I don't know about that. I mean, so I'd, I'd, I'd accumulated a lot of injuries, shoulder injuries, just the years of football. I mean, it's, and this isn't a, this isn't a knock on anyone. I mean, there was a lot of football was way behind as progressive as USC was in a lot of ways. And I absolutely loved uh, my years at, at USC, but I, I, you know, we had a wonderful medical staff. We had, we had, we had wonderful training staff, uh, strength training, but it wasn't until I got to the White Sox and, and realized, I mean, obviously the MLB, every player in MLB at every level has to throw, right? I mean, that is part of the job. Like no matter what position you're playing, you are, you're a thrower to some degree and you have to be at least somewhat competent at it. You don't have to be great at it, but you need to be competent. And so unlike football where one guy throws, uh, you, you know, on an entire team, you might have, th- you know, three to four guys who have to throw a ball. Uh, with some regularity, really only one guy. So there's not a lot of focus on developing, you know, shoulder programs and, you know, things that can preserve and and increase strength. It's kind of left to quarterbacks. I mean, the the biggest advice I got was, you know, don't do, we're not doing overhead presses. And that's something I never did. (laughs) That's Um, good advice though. (laughs) Yeah, it is. But that's the extent of of preservation in college football at that time. And it wasn't until I got to the White yeah. Sox where every, you know, shoulders are their focus. I mean, everybody's, I mean, you're hammering shoulders, you're doing, you're doing strengthening exercises as your warm up, as your cool down, you're doing, um, you know, they're, they're, it's a, they're primary, secondary, tertiary exercises targeting shoulder strength and stability and, yeah. and long term conditioning. So, all that to say, I came out uh, 2012 being with the White Sox, went back to arena football, my arm was as strong as it's ever been. But it wasn't until that till I finished that that I realized how really underpowered I had become, just with injuries and with time in my shoulders. So, and the other point I was going to make was, you know, looking back on like just the the absolute nonsense that we got growing up about how to treat shoulders. I mean, you know, we'd throw all day long. You know, you'd pitch five, six, seven, ten innings, whatever it may be, in little yeah. league or or in uh, travel ball or even high school. And then the, the prevailing thought, the prevailing wisdom at the time was to throw an ice pack on the shoulder. You know, you're icing your shoulder and your yeah. elbow and all this stuff. And we know now that that's absolutely the worst thing you can do, right? We want to do uh, functional uh, movements. And that's what we did with the, with the White Sox. I mean, we never did ice. And it, yeah. it, it just, you want to use that and keep the blood flow going, strengthen those muscles and the, and the, the ligaments and the connective tissues it was just a whole different world of thought. And it, so it's, it's remarkable looking back at how ignorant we were, but there was no way. I mean, again, again, we're talking pre-internet, pre, even with the internet. I mean, you can almost argue that, you know, there's better information, there's better <laughs> access to information, but there's also a lot more bullshit, so to speak, that you have to wade through. So it's, it's kind of, I think, zeroed out in a way. Um, I mean, I still run into people who are on those old school ways of treating things. And it's maybe I should contribute to, to getting better information out there. I don't, but, uh, Anyway, to your question about whether I felt like I was better off, I, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, yeah. would eight more years of, or even, you know, three more years of torching my arm and, and overusing it have, have been detrimental? I don't know. I mean, you look at Clayton Kershaw, you know, he came out and has had a Hall of Fame career, and he'd probably be a better one to ask than I would be about that. But, uh, you know, he may have had a whole different experience growing up and, and, and better access to knowledge and, and materials, really. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I, it, from when you played to now, medical, everything has a lot of that, especially sports medicine has changed. I uh, was in the military, a lot of our stuff changed. Like we used to have to yep. do a lot, things like that we don't know because chemical burn, things like that. But, but yeah, and so you had that. I mean, there's a lot of change. Like NIL, that's another huge change that coming in to college mm-hmm. as the number one guy, I mean, that would have been a big deal for you for sure. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, things have changed a lot, man, for Yeah, I'm 20 timing. years too old, apparently. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, well, so you talk about, you know, certainly, uh, you know, to your first point, the medical side, you know, the things that are changing, it's, uh, you know, the big thing with, with football has been concussion protocols. I think that's a good thing. So we can talk about this a lot, you know, and certainly people have, you know, I've seen this go around social media with Tom Brady talking about, you know, the change in rules, I don't think it's been good overall, I think how we go down our long haul in this, but I think the concussion protocols have been good. I, I've probably had just from football, 10 to 12 that have been undiagnosed that I can look at in hindsight and know, you know, for a fact where we're would have met the threshold. 
I think it was my senior year in college where they, it was the first time they made us do the uh, preseason concussion baseline test. I mean, I don't recall that. I mean, I didn't play a lot, but I can recall a couple of times that was applied. But even at that time, even in 2010, that was, it was something of an honor system. It relied on the team's own medical staff making those calls. And I, I, I don't know if it's what that is now. I think now there's a little more, there's a little more of a third party influence. I would think I, I would actually yeah. hope that that was the case. Um, you know, rules where you had to come out. Jump, wanted to go get back out there. hundred percent. I remember, you know, against Auburn, the worst hit I ever took. And it's, and I, I don't think fans, people who haven't played to some significant degree don't realize you know, the biggest hits, right. And it's the stuff that looks cool. And it's the stuff that gets tons of reposts. Those aren't the ones that hurt. I mean, I had my chin strap literally knocked off all four points at the U S army all American game in San Antonio. My, my, after my senior year, I never felt a thing. I mean, I'm sure I, you know, needed a, a spinal adjustment to some degree, <laughs> but it didn't hurt at all. Um, there was nothing about it that I, I, I was worried about but it looked amazing. I mean, I got hit so hard and I just went surfing across this wave of bodies and my chin strap got knocked off. I mean, it, I'm sure it would have made an amazing close up in today's with cameras everywhere. But at the time, it, the hardest hit I took was against Auburn. And the point I'm making was these big hits look fantastic, but you're, you're, my, you know, you're moving. If the player's moving a lot, his body's taking that impact and you're, you're transferring that energy away from your brain, so to speak. Your body's taking that hit. I took one against Auburn. We went head to head. It, it was like third and eight, and we called a quarterback sweep, which I don't know why. But I remember hitting the sideline and being a being a freshman had something to prove. And I'm going up against a junior strong safety who was, you know, at the time I I was six three, two hundred and ten pounds wet. This guy was six two, you know, two thirty, and had four years on me. And we met head to head with still like five yards short of the of the first down. I had no business even hitting this guy. I should have just stepped out of bounds. But we went helmet to helmet, and I remember, I mean, I feel like I got a hatchet thrown through the middle of my head. It hurts so oh. bad. And if you watch it on film, it's just we hit, we fall, we both fall down, and it's like it's so uneventful that nobody would have thought twice about it. Yeah. And I remember running back on the field, and I forget who it was, maybe, you know, John Louise or somebody grabbed me and said, hey, man, it's fourth down, like <laughs> wrong way. He literally grabbed my, my shoulder pads, and he said, hey, hey, man, wrong direction. And I had no clue what I was doing, what down it was, where I was, I, I just hadn't, oh I was so God. out of it. I'm glad it was the last play because I wouldn't have been able to function. And I remember sitting on the sideline, just like, again, like somebody just threw a hatchet through the middle of the top of my head. And uh, some, one of the trainers like, Hey, you have any ibuprofen? She gave me like two ibuprofen, 400 milligrams ibuprofen. <laughs> and uh, that was it. And I, I, I'll be honest, like, I, you know, to this day that, you know, we beat Auburn, they were number two that day. And okay, there's pictures of it, and there's all this celebration. This I, I remember almost nothing of that. I don't remember coming oh. off the field. I have some memory walking off the field, but I don't remember. You know, and I remember like driving away from the stadium, but everything else, I, I is a blur to me. I don't remember flying home. I don't remember, you know, being in the locker room. I don't remember really much of the day. I remember we ran a couple of you know fun plays, but that's it. And so, to the point being, the concussion protocol I think has been good. I think what tends to happen is we we go really to the extreme and the extreme right now is that targeting rules I think are a little excessive you know you see guys getting kicked out of games I see I think the broader point here is that refereeing and umpiring in sports has become a real problem I genuinely think it's getting worse and it's not just it's not a magnification issue right there are people who think that it's because we have better cameras and we have more exposure and, and this that's not the problem we have the problem is that they're genuinely making worse calls they are having greater influence over the game at least in my my perception of it yeah i think they have too much influence on the game and there's too much weight put on one call so i'll be honest like especially with baseball much of a casual observer as i am i, I think i hope that we're going to get to a point where they are our umpires are kind of pulled out of the game a little bit you know uh, what's his name who's the mlb umpire uh, that everybody makes a big stink about um what the hell's his name right now? Christian Hernandez or some whatever it is, but he's uh I should remember that. But anyway, he uh I mean he's awful. And it's you know, of course he has unions protecting him. Uh you know, he's got the umpire union yeah. doing that. But these are things that, that really drive viewership away from the games. They drive people away from it. 
Sorry, I'm going down the hole in this one, but I'd like to no, see it that. It takes away the game from the game for sure. And then we're also seeing, I mean, this is a smaller part. I mean, maybe a bigger part, I don't know, but uh, sports betting and prop bets, things like that are also affecting the game and stuff. But I was just, just going to say, whenever you make a call that not only is somebody maybe out for the rest of that game that affects the outcome of that game, yeah. but maybe they're even not allowed to play the next game depending on the call and things like that. I mean, these have – there's huge ramifications from one call, like to your point, which is which is tough. Yeah, I think you know there, it, it's weird to me the stuff that they've sent to re, to review, and then other things they've allowed just to be on the spot calls, right? Like like a, a I mean, I think a you know any sort of technical penalty or a uh, whatever they got targeting penalty ought to be a reviewable penalty. I mean, that ought to be not even reviewable. It it ought not be called. I mean, they they can flag it, but it ought to go to the booth for a determination. And all that to say, I think they need to relax the, the rules a little bit. I mean, I watched Tom Brady talk about this, and this was a, and he's exactly right. I mean, his his point was that mo- increasingly, more and more, there is less responsibility on the offensive of players to put themselves in a good position to avoid getting hurt. Even when I was at USC, God, way back in the day now, uh, you know, seven eight, through ten, every you know from day one, it was drilled in our heads that. The quarterback is always responsible, especially on like crossing routes, right? So we would we would run a uh, dig route or these shallow shallow digs, shallow drags. They rely on us reading, let's say, a weak side linebacker or a cornerback squatting on it. And if he gets blown up, that's on you. This isn't a cornerback harming him. I mean, this is squarely on the quarterback. Like you 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 didn't protect your teammate, and that responsibility fell square on him. I mean, if Ed Reed sitting in the middle of the field waiting to knock this guy's head off on a 12 yard dig route. Don't throw it to him. Right. I mean, that's not, yeah, don't, don't put somebody in position. <laughs> right. I mean, you know what the reads are, you know what the consequences are. And it was very clear that that's, you don't put them on that. I, I wouldn't expect Ed Reed to meter himself or, or, you know, play knock up football with, with my tight end running a, a 12 yard dig. Right. I yeah. should see him and get him. If he gets blown up, that's on me. And there has been, and he's absolutely right, there's been a, a, a tremendous de-emphasis on this to the point where you, you're not getting fewer guys hurt, you're getting more guys hurt, and there's less responsibility on the offensive players to, to protect themselves and play smart football. And I think that's a big problem, right? And you get defensive players, and, and it just takes away the other part is, right, so you have them holding up on guys where they normally wouldn't, and now offensive players are taking advantage of this um, they're going to find ways to beat the rules and, and, and take advantage of it. And the game just becomes not fun to watch. Right. I mean, it's like, you've got a guy who's trying to hold up on a dude ends up giving up a, a tackle and the guy breaks free and runs for 20 yards. Well, 20 years ago, that would have been a really exciting play, right? Cause they would have been actually two guys meeting, having to put their bodies together. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And now it's like, well, he got off on a technicality and there's no penalty for it. And so it's just not fun to watch. So anyway, going down the hole on that, uh, we were talking about yeah. nil. You know, NIL is – I get asked this a lot. Um, you know, I think it's more of it's been – more has been made of it than, than is justified. I mean, the fact of the matter is that nil, you know, NIL is new. And I think I, – you know, I tend to be a fan of the free market, right? And I think that's what we're going to yeah. see. We're in the first couple years of it. And the fact of the matter is that nobody knows what anything's worth, right? Nobody knows what – a lower level SEC quarterback is worth. I mean, that's just it, right? Yeah. So for right now, you know, companies are trying to figure this out. Sponsors are trying to figure this out. Players are trying to figure this out. And the representatives are trying to figure it out. How do they, how do you provide proper representation and at what costs and, and what's, you know, again, what's an Arkansas quarterback worth if they're 10th yeah. in the SEC, you know, and you're a Chevy dealership. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up at this point. But, <laughs> The, what, the fact of the matter is that within a few years, within within two to three years from now, the market will have figured it out and they'll say, yeah. okay, yeah, he wasn't worth $50,000 that year on this thing. So the next one, well, we'll, we'll shake it out. And it, again, the market blew up. It was wide open. It was completely, as far as I'm concerned, completely unregulated. And there were, there were no real restrictions on anything. I mean, you've got an LSU gymnast uh, making three and a half million dollars. <laughs> on some yeah. deals are good for her. I mean, yeah, hey, she's she, you know, on Instagram and all that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, hey, she had the, you know, she's got some talents and she has genetics and talent, and that's that's a good combination. <laughs> and uh, good is. for her. 
as far as I'm concerned, right? And her sponsors will have to determine if the next one's worth the same return, right? Did they get their money out of out of her that made it worth it? And I'm certainly not going to fault any student athlete for taking every dime he can get and doing the yeah. things. And I, 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 my hope would be that they're smart with it. You know, they, they're allowed to have good representation or able to get good representation. And the fact of the matter is, again, where the money comes, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of shills and, and shucksters who are just going to try to throw you a quick deal and make a quick dollar off your back. So, you know, I, I hope the representation comes with those guys and, and, um, I, again, I think more, more of it's made that's warranted, right? It's going to shake itself out in two, three years. It's not going to be as big a deal. The transfer portal will calm down. Uh, you know, everybody's, you know, the things going around this offseason, Nick Saban talking about how it's ruined college football and this, that, and the other. And I, you know, it, and it I, ruined I like, what he had going on because he yeah. couldn't be three deep at every position. I get it, right. you know, but. Right. I, yeah. I get it. I, I get Nick's point. I, I'm not going to mock him because I, I do respect him and what he's done. Yeah, I, I, but again, I think there's, there's a bit of hyperbole on it on every side, right? Which is that there's too much given to it by the fans. There's way too much. I mean, the obvious poke at coaches, right? Is that they've been driving up their own value. So let's say for years and, and, and rapidly in the last 10 to 15 years, I mean, you're talking, you know, what's next. I mean, Gus is worth millions a year. Nick's worth, I mean, he's, you know, they have these competitive contracts where they're, they're always the highest paid, right? Which means it's yeah. going up so fast. You know, good for Jimmy Sexton. Jimmy Sexton, as far as I'm, I know, represents half of college football. <laughs> and the guy's made an absolute fortune off it. He's, he's been brilliant at it. But I think too much has been made. I mean, because I guess my point is, if you're going to address one part of it, if you're Nick Saban, you got to address the other part, right? Because everybody looks at him and says, okay, but you're making, I don't know, seven, eight, ten million a year off this deal, yeah. or you were. Like, let's talk about the elephant in the room here, right? You want to talk about who's taking advantage of what. And I will take the task, the people who say, well, you're getting a free education out of the deal. Okay. Right. So during the season yeah. as a division one football player at any decent school, you're going to spend the better part of, I mean, I mean, if you count classwork, study, work, workouts, training, film, all your prep around it, travel. I mean, you're spending upwards of 80, 90 hours a week this isn't you know again this isn't you know whatever it was blue ball state or whatever the hell it was you know you're not fucking off and, and playing with the cheerleaders blue every mountain night. State. yeah blue mountain state i mean this is like dude this isn't it i mean if you're at a, uh, a decent sized division one school you're traveling you're practicing you're training you're studying you know i i can speak to working. one sec school but what's that said so you're working it's, it's a job it is. I mean, you're, you know, yeah, it's a, and I will say, I, I consider myself fortunate that I got to, I got a legitimately quarter million dollar education at USC paid for. That is awesome. I'm not complaining about that. But yeah. to look at a guy and say, I mean, I played with guys and this is no joke. My senior year, we got $1,250 a month in LA, in Los Angeles. You know, you can make that work, but I legitimately had, I played with guys who were sending money from that 1250 taking part of that and sending it back to their families yeah i mean let's not talk point, people, like people have kids things like that or you're trying to let's not yeah like let's yeah. let's serve in reality and so you know having some some ignorant redneck yell about how we got our school paid for isn't helping the cause right let's not you know they'll just be grateful they're getting it well okay let's talk about the reality right they're they're working it is a job and it's it's a much longer job if a lot of fun, it's also a lot of work. And you're putting, you know, there's, again, we talked about the physical risk of it, right? You're, you're one play away from never being able to do that again. But every potential There's no benefit. retirement involved there. Like, it feels trying to get there, but they're far off, it seems like. But, like, there's no, like, okay, you can't play ever again for the rest of your life. Go figure it out. There's no retirement plan with that. You're just there's no retirement plan. And they're just leaving you out to the, yep. to the wind. There's, there's no pension plan. There's no medical plan. And unless you're one of the top players with, with a huge obvious potential, you know, the massive potential, you're not getting a, a, an insurance plan to cover you in case of injury. And so, again, you're one play away from being just a normal dude who's now sacrificed. Good. Now, the, the thing is, most colleges, I, I, I struggle to think of one who hasn't honored it. You know, if you're on scholarship and you're a, you're a freshman or sophomore, I mean, I played with guys. Uh, Frankie Telford comes to mind. There may be a couple others who had career ending injuries or conditions and their scholarships were honored. Right. So it's not like they're getting yeah. dropped. 
and that's a good thing and i think it is the proper thing for a school to do just in that in that case so but to that point uh, yeah like that sort of argument is silly to not address the elephant in the room with the coaches is silly there is a tremendous amount of earnings off of this labor and again now i will say having said that that the coaches are worth i mean it, again you should get what it's worth right i mean i i will yeah. never fault gus or nick or any of the others for taking the money that they can get from the schools but it, it, again so all that to say i'll wrap it up with that is that i think nil is going to shake itself out in a few years people are going to figure out what what these guys are worth depending on their position and where they're at and how good the team is etc cetera, etc cetera. it'll slow down the transfer portal will calm down because there are disadvantages to transferring, right? I'm, I am I yeah. am glad to see that the, the penalties have been removed in a lot of ways, but there are disadvantages to it. It's not, you know, again, it's not always better. I don't regret the decision to transfer, but I know guys who do, and I can see the obvious downsides to doing it. So I think it's, again, everybody will figure it out. There'll, there'll be enough lessons learned in, in two to three more seasons of it, and it'll be a non-issue, right? It'll sort itself out, and we'll figure it out from there. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that there's – so, I mean, there's an ROI involved, right? And then on top of it, like right now, again, kind of crazy. March Madness is a good example where, like, uh, you have one good game, you're an unknown, and you're about to go in. Yeah, I, I don't that, – that dude from Oakland made a crazy amount of money, which is good for him. But to what you said, I, I, I like it, but there will be – they'll catch up to where they figure out what players are worth depending on what's going on. And because there'll be data on it. You need data to kind of just make those decisions. But yeah, I mean, I like it. I, I think that they deserve money, but I think there's probably going to have to be a cap or something because it's just going to make it tough. I think for football in particular, just because you got to have, maybe there needs to be more separation because in basketball, you can be a lower level of school and come out there and go beat a big dog, but you're not going to have your, your Oaklands and things like that come being able to play in Alabama or whatever and win. And so depending on the sport, it's a little different. But Yeah, I mean, I, again, I just don't see it as an issue. I, I think the market will decide, you know, it, it, the market will, will determine what happens with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, there, there's – it's not like there's infinite free money. You know, I think people think of it too much of a video game than it, more than it really is. I mean, this is – the money we're talking about, this is investment, right? This isn't this isn't free cash floating around. This is investment. So people are wanting returns on this sort of thing. If you think of it that way, I mean, again, it's like, you know, what's the newest the cyber truck worth from <laughs> from Tesla, right? Well, yeah. it's when it first was announced, it was infinite, right? It was infinitely valuable to a degree because there had never been anything like it, right? There was no precedence for it. Now they're just now hitting the road. I think in the next, you know, next few years, we're gonna figure out what the cyber truck's worth. Yeah. Right. And that's that's just it. It's like it's exciting, and that's just that's what nil is right now. Like we're in the first one or two seasons, whatever it is now. It's brand new. There's a ton of cash, but everybody wants again. Everybody wants a return on it. This isn't free. This isn't you know. Now, now some of it may be just deep pockets. We want the best guys at our school. That will be the issue at some point, possibly. But again, even these boosters, I mean, there's an expected return to this, right? That's it's yeah, you can't keep it's it either, up forever without a return. Right. It's either advertisement returns, however they, they measure, whatever the metric may be for that that expenditure, they want something back on it. So I, I genuinely do not see an IL as a major problem, even in the midterm, right? In the near in the midterm for the next four or five seasons, I'd see it fixing itself in a lot of ways. I think people just, you know, let it happen enjoy the game there are other issues with the game that are bigger problems than nil right now uh i genuinely believe that and i i don't think it's going to have as big an impact as people see now it may not be as exciting for a fan but again if you are not actually vested in some way it doesn't matter right i mean if unless it's impacting the bottom line for the schools it's not going to matter so what would really fix the game more than fixing nil or, or doing away with it, which I don't think is ever going to happen again. I think the previous model really sucked, and we could talk all day long about that. Mm -hmm. But what really would fix it was having a true playoff system. I and mean, we've been away from BCS for years now, yeah. and the playoff system is still not good. We're, we're really effectively where we were at the end of BCS, but more boring. 
right? Yeah. The bowl games are not as exciting because the bowl games aren't worth as much. They've diminished all the major bowl games, the Sugar Bowl, the Rose Bowl, you name it, the Orange Bowl. They've, they've all been diminished to the point of just being a playoff game rather than yeah. what they used to be. So I think a playoff system is infinitely better. A true playoff system is infinitely better than BCS. But the way they have it now, it's just BCS, but more boring. And that's not, nobody likes that, right? And now you're throwing an IL on top of that and guys are leaving early, guys are transferring before the bowl games. And I don't blame them for doing it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, you know, we, we, we can't talk out of both sides of our mouth here. Like you have to address the entire thing completely. And we act like, again, that people are so mad at players leaving. Coaches always left. They got fired. They got a new job. They were leaving early. Yeah. And, and you know what? People were still saying stuff about it, but it wasn't quite the big, you know, it wasn't destroying college football back then. And now suddenly it is like, well, I don't know. Coaches I, lie. And, and, and you're, you're a, let's say you're an 18 year old kid and a coach is feeling full of this and they want you here. And then all of a sudden that coach takes another job and is gone. And now you're stuck in a different system or whatever those guys like, yeah, they, they should be able to go somewhere, wherever they want to Well, go and that is, and that, is that, would, that would be my argument for the transfer portal, right, being what it is, which is essentially unrestricted, which it is now. I mean, at the time, yeah, you're exactly right. Like, you know, there were no minimum commitments from a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, you could get to a program, and within a year, within a season, it is completely unrecognizable. Now, how is that fair to an athlete, right? Like, I, I just spent all this time and energy and money picking a program – which I felt would serve me best in whatever way I deem most important for the next four to five years. And now that is utterly gone. Right. And so unless you're going to put minimum contracts on coaches, like put on a program, like, Hey, you can't fire Nick Saban until 2027 after 2027 is when you could consider this and actually give student athletes a, a chance to assess based on that. I remember having a talk with Mike Shula uh, at Alabama. Uh -huh. uh, this is before Saban was at Alabama. And genuinely one of the nicest dudes, the nicest coaches I talked to. And the conversation I had with him was, uh, and I remember we talked for like an hour, hour and a half. He was a really nice dude. And, and I just was, you know, maybe one of my rare moments of, of genuine un, unfiltered honesty. I was like, look, I, I would be happy to come to Alabama and take a look at it, but I don't have any confidence that you're going to be there in a year, you know, and it, as it turns out, right, I mean, I played a, yeah. absolutely maybe my worst game ever against Alabama in 06, but we beat them, and that was yeah. Mike Shula's last season. So that's a perfect example, right, which is like I, yeah. as much as I love the classic Alabama uniforms and that place is, is awesome and they have a phenomenal history, I had to be honest. Okay, well, there was tons of talk leading up to that season, and it turns out, I mean, you know, now, it wouldn't have been a bad idea with Nick Saban coming in after, but we don't know that, right? It could have just easily been Brett Bielema, God forbid. <laughs> so, um, I can edit that. Who's good? <laughs> yeah, no. So, uh, you know, we don't know these things, but those are, those are the best things. But, you know, hey, it'd be nice if we could say, hey, you know, Mike will be here through 2010. You know who's going to be here for the, the four to five, at least, you know, a good majority yeah. of your of your career. Uh, you know, in USC, I got Lane Kiffin my last season. Yeah. So, you know, nobody saw Pete Carroll even uh, early and it, and it, you know, it shook out and it wouldn't have made a difference for me at all, uh, whether he stayed in 2010 or not. But, you know, these are the things that people bank on. I mean, there were guys who came in for Pete Carroll and ended up with Lane Kiffin for a few seasons and then Steve Sarkeesian back. So, yeah, and that was you know, before Lane Kiffin was Lane Kiffin and everything like that. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys were excited for Lane to come back. He'd been a receivers coach and an offensive coordinator. Uh, so the guys who would have come in my okay. class in 06, uh, Lane would have been there and ha would have been recruiting them. Matter of fact, he tried to recruit me to USC uh, out of high school. You know, they were excited for Lane to come back. They remembered him as a as a receivers coach, as a coordinator, um, and was, he was very well liked. And, and frankly, Lane Kiffin is one of the most brilliant football minds I've been around. I mean, he's a very good, a very good football coach, despite what what 2010 shook out and his career shook out. I mean, the, the man knows, he knows the game really well, but back to the point of NIL and the transfer portal, you know, a different world. If you're planning on coming to Pete Carroll, you know, guys who came in with Nick Saban now are facing something totally different and yeah. they're going to have to figure that out, but they have the option to leave and not be penalized for that. And I think that's a good thing. And whether it benefits Alabama or not, you know, again, it's kind of like the saying says, you know, let them do what they want. Let the, let the program do what they want to do with their coach. Let Nick Saban do what he wants to do, but also let the players do what they want to do. 
if they're wrong, they're wrong. If they, if they get it right, great. I, I think the more unrestricted the market, the better. And I think the market will take care of itself, right? Guys will see yeah. that nil will, I wouldn't say dry up, but it'll tighten itself up. And the transfer portal will, you know, you'll start seeing more and more stories of guys who transferred maybe for the wrong reasons and didn't get what they wanted out of it. And, uh, you know, guys will take note of that and be a little more cautious. So I don't see a problem. In, in three or four years, I do not see a, a major problem with it. Yeah, I would agree. To, to bring it back a little bit, you, t- you spoke about the Alabama game. Uh-huh. I, as a Razorback fan, I don't think the Razorbacks have beat Alabama since that day. And so I call yeah. it I call it the Mitch Bus Day curse because since you've left, we we cannot beat that team. But granted, I don't blame you, but you know, don't get the, the name wrong there. But but we have not beat them since since you were at, at the, the range there. Well, I, there's not much to say about it. They they I, I won't take any credit for it. I, I think I threw like three interceptions and one touchdown that day and, and the, the the fact of the matter was that they were just worse than we were <laughs> that was the, <laughs> that was the saving grace uh there was no it was dogged determination who was going to be the least bad apparently that day right because they had lee tiffin who missed three or four field goals some silly i threw three interceptions yeah. i mean it was just literally who was going to make the the last mistake at that point and uh you know we got we got really lucky on that one the fact of the matter is that after that season you know they fired they fired mike shula they hired Nick Saban, and from that point on, it, I mean, it's not a curse. It was just they were a yeah. better team from that point forward. They they were a deeper talent. They had better coaching. Arkansas has made a, a remarkable series of poor hires. I got flamed yeah. in 2012 or 2013. I spoke at the Little Rock Touchdown Club, uh-huh. and I got ac- absolutely roasted. It was right after they hired Brett Bielema. I think it was the same week. Yeah. And I, I talked about what a poor hire it was. You cannot hire yeah. a Big Ten up the middle football coach, you know, from Wisconsin, who they were good in the Big Ten, but the Big Ten was yeah. terrible, right? They were the Wisconsin was a mid-level football team by any measure in a poor conference. And the, all they had to do every year was beat Michigan or, you know, yeah. I don't know, maybe Ohio State every once in a while. And the fact of the matter was that for all the problems that it had, best coach they had, they'd fired after he crashed his motorcycle, right? And and yeah. essentially, you know, he, he lied to Jeff Long and, and made it a real problem to him. So now, having said that, I, I think Bobby Trino is is one of the uh, certainly one of the most unpleasant humans I've ever interacted with on or near a football field or associated with football, I should say. But the fact of the matter is that his philosophy was exactly what Arkansas has to do in order to win football games. Right? <clears throat> we will never. I say we, Arkansas. I say because I'm in favor now. But Arkansas will never match the talent at Alabama, Georgia, Florida, LSU, Auburn. I mean, you you know, you can rattle off. Maybe South Carolina every couple of years, Tennessee, um, but they they are never going to out physical them. They're never going to match them pound for pound. They will they will never match those teams. I mean that's just a fact. Maybe from one season to the next, but on the whole, they're never going to do it. And I think that's an that's an okay reality if you accept it as reality. And the problem is that most people don't. And I think what what Petrino did was exactly what they need to do. You take you're going to be a smaller team. And so you need to be faster, you know, to, to put it in military terms, right? You need to, you need blitzkrieg, right? You're going to have, you're going to have smaller, faster, more mobile, quicker reacting teams. And that's how you win. And Bobby Petrino did a phenomenal job with what he had, right? He had a good quarterback in Ryan Mallett and he had, was it Joe Adams was around then, I believe. I mean, he had guys who could, who could yeah, be Tyler Wilson there towards the end. I, I loved watching Tyler, that guy too. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, and Gus really made a career of it as well, which is, you know, until he gave up, you know, what made him good, which is another thing we could talk about with coaches, and I think a major problem. But the fact of the matter is he took good, good players and made them a real problem for good teams, right, which or for great teams, I should say. And so we saw that with Ryan, and Ryan was, a, you know, Ryan's an awesome, he was an awesome guy, and Ryan was a really unique talent in a lot of ways, but Tyler's a perfect example. Tyler was never going to blow the wheels off anyone, but he was good and he was smart. And and you saw, I mean, Alabama was one for, for 15, well, damn near 20 years now with that exact model, right? Now they're yeah. just deeper and better. I mean, they're three, four deep All-Americans at every position. Arkansas doesn't have that. And so 
what Petrino does, he took guys who were super fast and he made it really difficult for them to cover. And you get, if you get a few guys who are disciplined, who are maybe better in some aspect, if not bigger and, and have more depth uh, overall, you can win a lot of games. And I think Arkansas has just absolutely missed that. And I don't know what it is. I, I, you know, you want to talk about a, a strange place with a, with a strange problem. This is it. But I think they're, you know, they could get back to it. They tried it with Chad Morris, who was a nightmare. Um, and then they went back the other way. Uh, and I don't know what the hell they're doing now. We'll see if, we'll see if Petrino can, can dredge him out if he's not the guy in charge. I, I highly doubt it, but we'll see. Yeah, that seems like last, last ditch effort. But I mean, it, it's tough with Sam because I like, I mean, people like Sam as a person and you, you want him to succeed, but. There's a yeah, lot of cares? expectations. On, yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of expectations on there that they I, just did not hit. Yeah. And it was the same yeah, for Brett Bielema. He was a nice guy, but he just, he couldn't get it done. Right. Yeah, bro was a blowhard. I, you uh, know, I, <laughs> I, I just don't care. And that's, a, that I think that's part of the problem. And I, you know, you see it with presidential elections, you see it with, with football coaches. Like, I don't care if he's a nice guy, you know, this, yeah. this, this leader of men and developer of young men and all this nonsense, like stop. Right. The best thing you can do for, for anyone, let alone some 18 to 22, 23 year old guys is teach them how to be competent, teach them how to manage and learn and, and to win and succeed. Right. And I think that is 100% it. I mean, that's it. Can you win football games? Can you not tank our program with, you know, some, some strange affair with some chick you hired? I mean, that, that <laughs> should be it. I mean, yeah, why can you do not- your job? Yeah, can you just can you just fucking do your job, right? I get paid a lot. Of money to do your job, so right, and it? that's it, right? Like I don't care if you're a nice dude. I don't care, you know. I, I, I just literally don't care. Yeah, and I, I think people need to stop putting that on. Like, well, he's a nice guy. We can't find or you know what I think is the Arkansas issue, which is so weird to me, uh, because there are deep pockets here who are willing to pay. Yeah. Is well, who are we going to find better? We can't find anybody else. Well. You suck now, so why not just try something else? And if you suck, well, you're in the same spot, but you know you've actually done something for it. I, I just I don't understand the mentality. I don't understand people. I, this is one that was going on when I was here, and even leading up to, which I never understood, which was the constant conversation about like, well, you know, we won eight games in the SEC. Like, what? Who cares if you go twelve and one, and you lose the SEC championship, and you lose the bowl game, or so you're twelve and two, or whatever the hell it may be now what's the point what is the point right like uh, yeah it's what okay you won 12 games but you wow cool you won the sugar bowl you didn't win a championship yeah so i don't i don't understand i never understood that and i don't understand it now right i mean i look at my my junior year in high school we went 12 and 1 but we lost to central in the semifinals like that that season for me was a it was a loss yeah it wasn't a win i don't look at it and go well we won 12 of the no, I think of the last game and how we absolutely got our ass kicked and got my arm broken Thanks, half. And, and yeah, we didn't go to the championship. Like it's, it's a, it's a all or nothing, right? It's a zero sum game. And I think people need to look at it that way, which is if I'm going to invest this type of money and this type of energy and this type of time, I expect a return. And the return is everything, right? Yeah. Stop floating people along because they have a 500 record. Stop floating people along because they won 10 games. Like 10 became a, a weird threshold. Yeah. Like you, yeah. You can be it's 10 and four. It's a, it's a pretty number. It's a nice it round is. number. We, we well, like, we won. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we won double digits and we beat LSU and Little Rock. Like, what? I don't understand. Like, that's, it's such a weird, odd, it's loser thinking in a lot of ways. And it needs yeah, to stop. Um, you know, and I would tell him if, if, if the, you know, I don't know how many, how many more years they're going to give Sam Pittman now that he's hired uh, Petrino. I would say yeah. two at most. I, I don't see how that's going to work out that well. But, you know, yeah. Sam really doesn't have a choice. You know, he's in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, he's in a situation that Houston Nutt was in, in in 2006 when he hired Malzahn. I mean, he didn't have a choice. You, you know, I'm sure it wasn't. It may have been. Let me ask idea. you about that, actually. Like, how do you, do you know how that went down, really? You know, it's funny you ask that. It, um, so as the years go, I was talking to somebody about this recently. They were talking about the, the documentary uh, that Matt Wolf did. You know, it's funny how these things go. I mean, it really, I wasn't that far removed when we did the documentary at the end of 2011. And since then, I've run into several people who have given more and more information. And, and so it's, it's funny to look at how little anybody, any one person really knows about the whole thing. 
including myself. I mean, there were things that were happening. You know, I knew a good a good deal of it when I was in it. But you always have to infer motive. You always have to infer what might come of it if you if you allowed to continue. You know, I, I think Houston was given an ultimatum. I don't think I don't think that you know certainly it was not his idea to bring Gus in. That was obvious to anyone who had who was who was anywhere near it. I mean, we ran a hybrid offense that wasn't Gus's. It wasn't the old Arkansas. And I actually found a wristband the other day. I was moving some stuff, and I found one of my wristbands with the play calls on it. And I was looking through it, and none of it made any sense. I was like, it took me a second to realize. I thought, I thought for a second it was one of mine from high school. It was just a hodgepodge of just nonsense, and it was a real issue. And you can see that. I remember having seven on, you know, our, our summer ball stuff, which was player led, and you know, it's Casey, Dick, and I, and Darren, and Felix, and and you know, all the guys, right? Yeah. And we're trying to explain to each other each little piece, like how their piece fits in and what our piece is supposed to look like. And then we're just trying to like figure out how these are supposed to mash up and what it's supposed to be called, this, that, and the other. And just today I found a picture uh, from Utah State where I had a I had my eyes split open. Darren and I were not on the same page. It was supposed to be a handoff. <laughs> he thought he was pass blocking. I ended up getting smoked by a middle linebacker from Utah State and getting my eyes split open. And But that play was a, was the perfect demonstration of of the issues that we had that year so long and short is you know houston i'm sure was given an ultimatum and then i i think honestly what i think was probably going on this is what i'd heard later on which makes sense was that he was getting pushed out you know they were going to move frank along uh who's you know by the time he left he was he was demented uh to the point that it nothing made sense <laughs> uh, I, I think they were going to try to move houston into the ad role move gus into the, the head coach role and in fairness to to Houston, I mean, nobody's going to like that, right? Yeah. Nobody's going to take well to that. And I, I certainly wouldn't, you know, it's not like I expected him to to just move on up and, and take an admin role. Even though it's not a bad role, you're going to feel yeah. slighted to some degree. So I think there was a lot of bad blood. I think there was a lot of, it's just typical ego nonsense. There were a lot of promises made by a lot of people who had no business making the promises, nor could they even have expected to keep them. Right. In hindsight, that was that was really the issue. And I'm sure it was it wasn't just to me. It wasn't just to Gus. It was to Houston. I'm sure there were promises made to to legitimately at every single level in that that were either outright lies or there they had zero expectation that they could be fulfilled in any real sense. So it's kind of an unfortunate deal all around. Yeah, really a, an odd thing. A young kid, you know, at the time and you're just stuck in the middle of all this crap. Yeah, you're thinking, I mean, thinking that you made the right decision, and then you're you're just kind of stuck in the middle of a big mess. Yeah, I mean, in hindsight, it's it's easy to say now, right? And it wasn't it didn't take that long to figure it out, but it's you know, yeah, it was nonsense from one and the other. There was just there's too much going on. Hard to say one way or another whether I you know I I certainly think I you know could have gone some other routes early on, but who knows how that would have shaken out and where it would where it would lead and if it'd be better or not, but. Anyway, yeah, it was a it was a silly deal, and um, you know, one of those things that just never really there was no recovery from it. I mean, it it went on, and that really for me was kind of the end of of a lot of things. I mean, that kind of took the fire and the fun out of a lot of it, and from that point on, there was no can't say I really cared about a lot of it. So, Sucks. here's what it is. So you when you were eight and zero, and then you got benched early on, and that was the South Carolina game. Mm-hmm. Did, did all that play into that and why did that even happen as a fan like I don't even think we yeah, I mean at least I didn't ever really know like why like you you were I mean I know you said you had your moments this and that or you know the Alabama game where you sure. had an interception but dude you were eight no you were a freshman I mean you were doing yeah. your job well, you're winning there's a lot to unpack there I mean the, I guess the first truth is is that I you know I was treading water all season I mean I I was you know, I remember having a discussion with Houston before the season started that I was not ready. I didn't want to start. There were issues with the system. There were certainly, you know, I, I just was not physically ready. I mean, you saw the same thing. So I brought this comparison up before, and I think it's a good one, is with Matt Stafford. I mean, Matt Stafford had a, in, a, in some ways, a parallel season that I did. A lot of struggles. Um, he got, he said he got benched at some point in the season. The difference was that Georgia had a plan in place yeah. to develop Matt Stafford. And when he got benched, it wasn't terminal, right? It was, it was a development issue. It was a time, it, it was really, a, it was a strategic pause 
on him on his career. It was a tactical pause for Georgia through the season, and they did well. And it allowed them to pull back, address the issues that he was having, and then continue, right? Come back either later in the season or the next season and, and be developed from that, right? It's just Georgia handled Matt Stafford the way you should handle a young quarterback. It is a position unlike almost any other in football, which requires, I don't mean delicate handling in the fact, in the sense that we're all sensitive, too sensitive to do it. It's, it's delicate in the sense it is a highly skilled position. It is a position which requires, I mean, you're the only guy, you in the center are the only guys on the team who handle the ball every single play. And it's not really a coincidence that the centers and the quarterbacks tend to be on the more intelligent side on, on any football team. All that to say, Georgia had a plan in place. They knew what they wanted to see out of them. They knew what the limit was. You know, they, they had a, a loss limit with, let's say. So they knew at a certain point that not only began to be detrimental to Georgia as a football team, but also to Matt as a quarterback. And that was their cutoff. And so they pulled him at that point, got him the reps in practice, got him some extra film study, got him, you know, whatever they needed to do to get him back in and then get the confidence back and get him back in the game. We did not have that at Arkansas. I was treading water. There's a lot of ego at play. There's a lot of, of, I mean, things that I still don't really even, I can't even speak to with any real knowledge about, you know, between Gus and Houston and, and all the other guys. There was just too much going on that was not focused on the, the success of the team, that was not focused on my development as a player. <clears throat> so those are the big things. And then as for the South Carolina game, I, I would give benefit of the doubt if there was anything from that point that resembled, again, what Georgia did with Matt. There wasn't. Yeah. There was no extra focus. There was no extra attention. There was no explanation as to, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we need to do. Uh, here's what the plan is from this point forward, whether it be from, you know, for the rest of the season or from that point going into the spring. There was none. I mean, there was none even in the large gap between the SEC game and the bowl game. And so for me, I mean, people talk about, well, you should have stuck around and done it. Well, there was zero expectation that anything was going to change. There was legitimately not one word said to me about anything from the time I got benched at South Carolina to the time I left on January 1st or whatever day it was. So I had, there, there was really zero expectation that there'd be any change, that there'd be any really, you know, fundamental advancement in, in my career and staying, especially when I had the opportunity, you know, I had people calling and I had the opportunity to, to go other places and, and do other things. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of how that season ran out. And that's how you know, I think that's that's a decent summary of of events. And it's just it's unfortunate. Almost anywhere else that I had the opportunity to go, there would have been either a slower introduction into it or a better correction on the back end of it from from years one to two. And there just wasn't. Sure, there was pressure on uh, there and two to get you in there right away because because uh, of <laughs> what you were at the time, number one guy and all that. It, it was just. For the fans, it was frustrating because I, I get it that, I mean, you're kind of hard on yourself, but at the same time, what we talked about earlier is you're winning and you're doing your job. You're a freshman, mm -hmm. you're throwing this crazy system. There's, you know, a lot of behind the scenes stuff and coaching going on, but you're still 8 no, And then you just get full, obviously no explanation. And, and then it goes out the way it goes out. Because that year it was against Florida in the SEC championship game, right? And so that would have been cool because that, that was Tebow, right? So that would have been cool to see that. You, you guys have went out before, so that, that would have been very well, cool to see that, right? And so that, yeah. it was frustrating. For that year, so Tebow, a Tebow had a, a very similar year. Uh, I mean, Tebow, Tebow played, if I recall, right, and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, but Chris Leak was yeah, still wow. in Florida. I was Chris right, Leak was Chris a senior Lee. there. And I mean, Chris Leak had the, the most beautiful spiral ever in college football. I mean, the guy could really play. He wasn't ultimately as talented as, as Tim was, but – Tim played less than, than Matt or I, either one played. Okay. Um, right. You know, but Chris Leak was still there. Yeah, so it, it's... So that was, that was a good point then, but you kind of knew what the ceiling was, I felt like. I mean, I know Shade Casey did, he was fine, and, um, but well, I feel like we kind of knew the ceiling there, and we kind of, as fans, wanted to see you develop and what, where that was going to go, and then whenever you're, as I said, 8 no. And you get pulled, and then we're like, and then obviously guests leaving, and you leaving, and everybody understood why. That if we knew that something wasn't right there, and, yeah. 
and everything. But it it was it was very like it sucked as a as a fan, and you had a, a good you know you had there's so many good players around that time too. Because you say it's hard to get those guys at Arkansas, but man, y'all y'all had some studs around that time. And so it sucked yeah. uh, to see you go to USC and everything, but we understood it. What sold you on USC over other schools? And because I know you were, I mean, I'm sure you got hit up by plenty. And because at the time USC was a big deal, it was a pretty simple calculation. I, I, you know, embarrassingly simple in hindsight, but it, I wouldn't say I regretted it. I mean, again, you know, everything I didn't do from that point forward was totally on me. And uh, the simple point is, that, you know, USC called. I looked at Tulsa because Gus had gone there. And when USC, I talked to Pete, uh, Damien had left before the bowl game. And so through him, uh, I was communicating with Pete Carroll and, and, you know, there were still some rules in place about how that could go. And uh, anyway, I took a visit to USC in February uh, of 07. And the, the simple calculation was I'd seen one end of the spectrum, which was Arkansas, which was, as far as I was concerned, in every respect, not a serious program. I mean, and that's, that was it. That's it was not a serious, I well, I mean, it, it was not a serious football program. It was not, you take all the stuff we just talked about just by way of, by way of demonstrating how unserious this place is. Okay. I could not get a fair pair of football cleats that weren't like, I wasn't swimming in, but so this little story here. So against Tennessee, it was like 20 something degrees that night. We played Tennessee at home. And everybody was getting like tall, thick, heavy duty socks, right? Cold weather socks. Yeah. And I walked up to the equipment window and it was a window in the hallway and the guy, you know, to the equipment room and he's like, oh, what do you need? And I was like, oh, can I get a pair of those, you know, a pair of tall socks? And he's like, oh, we're out. And I was like, oh, okay, that, that's plausible. And I, you know, I tend to trust people at the time, especially. And uh, I was like, okay, sure. You know, and I, the guy, the equipment guys didn't like me that much anyway, which maybe I'm not that likable. I don't know. Um, so I go back to the locker room and I'm getting ready. And one of the ball boys is there and I, he and I, uh, got along well. And I said, Hey, would you mind grabbing me? Cause guys were coming back in with cold weather socks. Like after I'd asked, they were yeah. coming in with their own. And so I was like, Hey, would you mind grabbing me a pair? Just if you're out there. And he didn't know that I'd gone and asked already. I was like, hey, would you mind grabbing? He's like, Oh yeah, no problem. He comes back with two pairs. Oh, I was my like, oh. God. I go, I go, Oh, Hey, thanks dude. I go, where were they? And he's like, Oh, they, they're just the guy had them in the bin under the window, like where they normally are. And I was like, okay, cool. Thanks. So that story alone wow. demonstrates how unserious it was, right? Like they, they just were petty. Yeah. They were changing grades at the end of the semester. They failed Damien out of a class. They failed me out of a class when I decided to transfer. So the program, so there's the football program, there's wow. the college, there's the university as a whole was in, was involved in this. I mean, I, I have, I have zero love. And people get, you know, again, people get mad not knowing a lot of this stuff, you know, but, you know, I said before, like, if they'd never won another game, I wouldn't care. And I mean that Damn. because, you know, people act like because because Frank Broyles is gone or Jeff Long's gone or whatever. It's the same. Now, it may be a little different now. I'm not going to hold my breath. The point being, I've seen that level of it, which, as Gus would say, Mickey Mouse stuff. And then I went to USC and USC in every single sense is the opposite. It is a no nonsense private university where and, and when I say no nonsense I mean study hall at Arkansas was an hour in a, a week in a lab just shut in with all the other guys no tutors nothing just like we said you did an hour you're going to sit here for an hour and then we're good yeah. USC was the opposite you got tutors for every class until you had a B grade or higher you got you were mandatory study hours in the in the what we called SAS it was a student athlete academic uh, services center SAS and you were there, you know, it may be eight hours of tutoring a week to start. And so you got a tutor for every single class. You had set hours. You had to be there when you weren't at practice. They were extremely strict on how, like, if you, you couldn't interact with your tutors outside of that. So they were very strict on keeping separation. So there was zero yeah. hint of impropriety. They had guys who came and checked that you were in classes. They would literally walk into a, a class with 200 people in it and look for every guy on the roster in that class okay. who was on the team. And they would check off if you were in class or not. And if you weren't, your, your ass was out at 5.30 in the morning on Wednesday morning with your position coach who wasn't too pumped about being there at 5.30 in the morning. And <laughs> they, would, they, would, they would legit make you bear crawl and, and barrel roll until you, until you puked. 
Yeah. I mean, they were serious about this stuff, right? And so I can honestly say at USC, when I was there and the years I was there, there was zero of there was zero cheating, there was zero hint of cheating. It wasn't like the school was contacting your professors for you when you had to travel to the SEC championship. If you had an if you had a away game and you were gonna miss a class, like if we went to Ohio State, so we left early on Thursday, or we left Thursday night or we left early on Friday and you were gonna miss classes, it was your responsibility. You had to take a form yourself to your professor and say hey here's what we're missing you know please make sure i have everything i need so that i can get everything done for you i mean you had to do everything yourself and they were very strict about that so the contrast for me was was stark right the reality of that was stark then you take that it was 2000 at this point is the end of 06 early 07 usc is coming off one of the the hotter streaks they just played one of the the best championship football games ever played as far as i'm concerned which I will say Vince Young, I, I think that is still to this day one of the greatest yeah. single individual performances ever in a football game, in a college football game. Vince Young in that game. But USC, to their credit, had just come off the 03 championship, the 04 championship, and then they just battled for the 05 and got beat. But I think, like I said, it was, I think, one of the best performances ever. They were a hot program. In 06, they did well. John David Booty's there. Mark Sanchez is coming off. You know, he'd been there two seasons or one, yeah, two seasons at that point. So USC was a much different program than what Arkansas was. And so to, I'm, I'm giving a long walk to a little house here, but the point was I'd seen one side of the spectrum. And my thought was, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go to the other side of the spectrum. I don't want to go to Tulsa and feel like I'm riding Gus's coattail. I'm going to go to yeah. one of the hotter schools. I couldn't go to another SEC school. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a, that's a whole nother battle. So coaches had to sign releases at that point. Um, Arkansas could have theoretically opted out of releasing me, uh, which would have put me in a bind. Nutt was blocking you, wasn't he? What's that? Yeah, uh, Houston Nutt was blocking your transfer first, and he granted it. But you're, but you're saying he wouldn't allow an SEC transfer? Is that is that? What it, if I remember it correctly, there were rules around with, like inter SEC, uh, inter SEC transfers were treated. They there was some extra penalty on top of them, and maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm missing that wrong. Maybe it was with like SEC West, uh, like within a within the, uh, the the division, um, yeah. if not a, with the entire conference. I mean, Houston, like, the day I asked for my transfer, he's like, oh, give me a day or two to think about it. Uh-huh. And I'm just going to, I don't think I've told this story before. He's like, oh, you give me, you know, he acted like he was really thinking about this. And I'm like, okay, cool. I showed up two hours later. I was like, you know, screw that. I want to, I'm getting it today. I'm not coming back. He'd already called everybody in the media. Every Arkansas media outlet, sports outlet was there in his office when I walked in. They had no idea it was coming, and it was very obvious. He so he was going to set up this whole conference without me knowing it, talking about whatever he was, whatever nonsense he was going to talk about. And I walked in to in his secretary, and all the I remember literally walking in. So when you walked in his office, there was his secretary was right there, her office, but they both his main office is the next door. But if you look left from her office, there was a conference room, and that door was wide open, and there was like twenty reporters in there just standing there waiting for him to come in. And this is after he told me, oh, give me 24 hours. Let's both think about it for 24 hours. And I was like, okay, two hours later, he's got every reporter in there. And he was going to, he was going <laughs> to, and I, I walked in and all of them, their faces were like, they were like, oh shit, what's this guy doing here? And uh, I think they were surprised. Nobody said a word. And I, I just told her, I said, I'm getting my release now. And so I can wait and we can get this done. And I ended up getting it, walking out with it at that moment. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, I mean, it's just little stuff like that. The point being, you know, I went to USC and that was, I loved the school uh, as a university. They were phenomenal. My academic services support was, was phenomenal as a football program. Uh, again, it, everything from that point on was mine. I, I didn't really take advantage yeah. of it. And I was kind of, kind of burnt out on the whole thing, but Pete Carroll was phenomenal. One of the, one of the absolutely the, the most phenomenal leaders I've ever been around. I mean, the guy from everybody, from the, the janitorial staff, to the, the city, you know, the community members, to the boosters, to the players. I mean, he'd have us pumped up on week 10 on a Tuesday, ready to kill each other. Pete Carroll was phenomenal. And so I, I got to learn a lot from that uh, and learn a lot of good football. Ended up practicing a lot, not playing a lot, but it, uh, it turned out to be a, a good experience for me on the whole in retrospect. And I don't regret that, but that's how I chose USC. I, I thought I've seen one in the spectrum. I want to see the other side. USC's hot right now. It's a different program. It's a different planet. And it was, I moved 1500 miles away and I got to go to a, a, a really good private school and have it all paid for and be around some of the best athletes and, and best academics. And, and just, you know, the, the general student population was totally different than 
than anything I'd experienced at that point. So that's how I ended up there. I, got yeah, I mean, e even as a hog fan, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy for you on that. I'm, I'm glad you got, not only got out of that situation, it sucks that you had to be penalized to mm -hmm. sit out a year and all that. Cause it's not sure. 2024, 20, but uh, I'm glad you got in a better situation. You, know, you got to work under Pete Carroll and Lane Kiffin and, and all these other amazing athletes that you got to um, work with. And so yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you had that uh, post Arkansas, man. Really am. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was a, uh, it was a good time. And I, there are things I wish I would have done different once I left and, and, but uh, you know, on the whole, it provided a, a good base for me. So that's it. Uh I mean, honestly, it pisses me off a little bit that you were a kid still and you're, you're getting done this way. And you, you said after you transferred, you got failed in a class. And you, how old were you at that time? You're still probably 18, right? 19? Uh, I turned 19 at the end of February. So I still would have been 18 when I, when I got my transfer. Yeah, I mean, you were still a kid and they're doing dirty a lot for your education. That, yeah, I mean there was there was me there was a lot of there was a lot of playing around outside of that, and that was that was a big factor. I mean, it, you know, and everybody knows the other stories, right? With with Teresa Pruitt and all of you know Houston's connections and all that stuff. But there were other things that that went on uh, on the academic side that made it really a pain to transfer. But yeah, it was interesting. So yeah. I've seen it. I, I I you know again I I think people are ignorant. Certainly the fans are ignorant when they talk about. You know, like I said, the Bielema thing, I got roasted for that. And I think there's just, there's, there's far more ignorance to it than there ought to be. Uh, but it's easier for people to say stuff when they're, they're not vested in it, right? They don't have, uh, they don't make it painful for the university to keep making bad decisions. And that's, yeah. and that's a problem. But I mean, there's something called a subject matter expert. And whenever I got a former QB for the university you're talking about saying it's a bad hire, not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to hear him out and hear, hear why, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't always take it with a grain of salt. You know, certainly I, I, I've been wrong one, once or twice before uh, with things like this. But, you know, th there is there's certainly a bit inside of it. I, yeah, you know, Arkansas, it, and that's the other thing, right? People talk about Fayetteville, and Fayetteville's a wonderful town. You know, I've been back here a year. And, and really enjoyed it. You know, it's been 16, almost 17 years since I left or really 17 now. And uh, it is a wonderful town, but they, they, they think that's going to be a selling point. Like, yeah, go to a college town anywhere in America and it's, it's fun. Right. I mean, it's, if you're, if you're 18, 17, 18, like it doesn't matter. Right. You mean Starkville, Mississippi, which as a 35 year old, I'm not sure I'd want to live in Starkville, Mississippi, <laughs> but when I'm when I'm 18 to 22, like who cares, right? I mean, it's yeah. they've got bars, there's frat houses, they're good, there's good looking women. Like nobody yeah. cares, dude. You know what I mean? Like we're not we're not sitting here looking at the fall leaves and the beautiful Ozark Mountains <laughs> and considering and pondering, you know, our no, our new home on the mountain here. It's like, dude, come on, be real, right? People just, I for yeah. whatever reason, people really can't pull themselves out of their own perspective and look at what kids are looking at, right? Like I lived in South Central LA and really comparatively, I mean, Arkansas had brand new dorms and, and USC had shitty old dorms at the time and and you're living in the hood and, and there's bars on windows and nobody cares, dude. Nobody yeah. cares, right? Like it's it's fun and we had a oh, good time. Good. And yeah, like nobody, nobody cares about that sort of thing. Like, you know, again, I'd rather live in Fayetteville than South Central LA now yeah. But for whatever reason, people just, they think that's going to sell it alone. And it's not. I mean, the fact matters, so this kind of goes back to what we talked about before, win games, right? Like, I don't care how nice the coach is. I don't care that he's a family guy. I don't care that, you know, I don't care what his alma mater is. I, like, win football games. Like, can you do that? And can you please, while you're doing it, not be a complete 12-year-old on the sideline. Like, quit throwing fits. Quit acting like a jerk. Just win yeah, games. Special. And, yeah, and like be, I mean, out. I mean, for all the stuff you can say about uh, Nick Saban, I mean, you know, he get a little over the top, I think, on the sidelines sometimes. But he also has, you know, some of the great viral videos. You know, when he was in Michigan State, he talks about the, you know, I, I forget the guy's name, but a couple of the players. People are just so reactionary in every sense, yeah. and I think Nick was a he was a great example in that sense, which is we're we're not going to allow guys to screw up their careers and their lives with a, with a single mistake. And that's the coach you need. I mean, Nick Saban, by any count, I'm sure there are plenty of guys who are not happy to play for him. And there are plenty of accounts of him being a complete, I would say a complete jerk. I mean, he seems like a considerate guy. 
but Nick Saban also doesn't strike me as a guy who cares whether you like him or not. And there's some value, in fact, if you don't, uh, if you're if you are a little bit concerned with what he's going to do. Uh, but those are the guys you want, right? You want someone who's hyper competent, somebody who's who's sure about what they're doing, somebody who's going to protect the program. And protect the program means winning games. It means not letting guys get away with things one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, you got young guys playing for you. I mean, you, you need to be impressionable, but you know, you can make the point. But most coaches aren't. You know, they're not good role models themselves in any number of ways, but they're also hyper reactionary and they're they're afraid to put their foot down and, and you know make good examples for, for the guys at the same time. So, you know, Nick was rare in that in that uh, in that example. Pete was I'd put right alongside him. Uh you know, I can remember Pete and uh, you know, our, our athletic director at the time getting after it. I mean, like legit yelling at each other in the offices, in the hallways. I mean, just disagreements about the way the program needed to be handled. But Pete was that guy, right? He was that guy who was, he was going to protect his players. He was going to protect the program all at the same time. I mean, he could really see the whole picture. And those are the guys, I mean, again, if you're going to spend the money, go find those guys, right? Yeah. I mean, I've always said if, if Arkansas were serious about this, they would make the most obscene offer. And, you know, he's gone now, but I said this five, ten years ago with Nick Saban. I'd make the most obscene offer to get Nick Saban ever. I mean, legitimately throw, you know, at the time yeah. he was making five million a year, I'd throw ten million a year at him. Because they, 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 the money's there, from what I understand, and and we just don't. We're just. I think uh, there's some. Guy, there's some. He's a diamond in the some, rough. Yeah, there's some chronic fear of of doing so. I would go to Nick Saban. I'd say, look, we'll pay you way, way, way above. I mean, so unfat. Like, make Alabama actually counter it. Yeah. But be so absurd that everybody takes note, right? I mean, you need to pull the biggest talent you can pull. But anyway, that that would be my my plan. If I had uh, if I had a wrangle on the purse at Arkansas, I would just it, you have to be absurd. Yeah, uh, you're not going to win another way. So I would agree. And and to your other point, no good leader cares about if everybody likes him. <laughs> Right. It's just not a trait that they have. And yeah, and who cares? I mean, you get fired, you make six million a year, you know a year anyway. Like you're getting paid you know, they fire to be on the couch at that point. Yeah, they fire you and give you twenty one million dollars. Hell yeah, dude! I'll I'll be out yeah. there every four years. Like, just move me along. So, <laughs> but I mean, who like cares? Coach you know? Cal right now uh, for K- Kentucky basketball. That dude's on a lifetime contract. I mean, it's some absurd. Like, I think it's like sixty or seventy mil they'd have to pay him if they fired him or something stupid. And uh, it's so uh, yeah, he's the, he's on a literal lifetime contract, but all the fans want him gone because they're tired of being knocked out by St. Peter's and Oakland and shit. And uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is I mean, that dude care. Uh, if, he, if he gets fired, uh, you know, he's he's set. But fans are getting their their word yeah. out there a little bit too much nowadays with social media and really kind of honestly, I, I think they're scared for fruits away just. Around their mouth, student like the. Oh, did you see that? You, you probably had not fall out with uh, the whole love triangle thing with Arkansas basketball this year. Where the, essentially, the fans well, started it. So they started a thing where it was like Devo and Tremont Mark and and Trevor Brazil. They're basically saying there was a there was a love triangle there that that they were all you know dude crushing on each other, whatever you want to call it. And um, it 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 wasn't true. From from my understanding, but it, it was literally a fan started thing, and then some idiot put it out there on a legit article, or not legit, but you know, I mean, an article that people were reading, and it got out there. It, it was national news that there, you know, we're hogs are losing, and there's a love triangle, and I mean, you, you think you think kids want to come into a program and deal with that? But it's, it, I guess it makes it sound like there's not a whole lot different from. From uh, what you're, you know, a lot of stuff you're dealing with, just a lot of amateur shit, you know. Yeah, I mean, the big thing, you know, when I was there, like I said, it was you're still talking chat boards and that sort of thing, but the the college itself had a media program that was much bigger than I had access to as an individual. So that that was the kind of thing we were dealing with then. But yeah, it's all nonsense. I mean, fans are idiots. <laughs> so yeah. you know, the fact that everybody's an idiot in this game, right? I was an idiot then, and I, I won't exclude myself from that. Certainly, I was an idiot. Gus was an idiot. You know, everybody was just, you know, with cooler heads, you sit back at the end of it. And it's, if there is a problem, it's that it's a perpetuating cycle. It's a self perpetuating endless cycle that's just, yeah, it, it never changes. Right. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's part of the boredom of it all, which is like, it's, 
there's nothing different now 20 years later really than there was 50 years ago it's just the same game over and over again it's just i mean people don't learn somehow it just gets more expensive so (laughs) that's it one other thing i definitely want to ask you is uh just off topic is what's your favorite football movie my favorite football movie yeah oh division three football's finest what? I, no, I, I, I was going to write right. it down, but I ain't got a pen on me. All right, so uh, I, I'll text this to you after, but this okay. is legitimately, so it's Andy Dick's crowning film, and it came out in like 2008, maybe. Okay. And I think it is it is one of the best football movies made. It's like, imagine you know Blue Mountain State mixed with like, uh, I don't know, just any other cheesy, shitty football movie, but it's out of control. I think it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it's it really sums up in a lot of ways what college football at any level is. And it's he's a washed up old football coach. He's kind of a psychopath, and he takes over the small college football team for a season after their head coach has a heart attack and dies. And it's it's absurd. From it's typical Andy Dick. It's absurd from one to another, uh, but it's legitimately my favorite football movie. Awesome. Yeah, that I, I'm excited for that because my son is like, Dad, I, you know, he likes watching the old school football movies and stuff. And he's like, you got to probably something he? I haven't seen. Uh, he's a junior in high school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's out there. So, but if he's that old, it'll be, yeah, yeah. it's nothing he had, it's nothing he hadn't heard before. Uh, exactly, but yeah. it's, yeah, division, division three, football's finest. Okay. And uh, like, I would suggest it to anyone. I think it's, I think it's outrageous, but it's great. All right. So, yeah. Yep. I was going to get into some baseball stuff too, but yeah, sure. I, well, one thing I'll show you, I got the cannonballer shirt on today because uh-huh. uh, I know you, your last stint, you were on the Intimidators. Is that right? With yeah. I played Annapolis. with Annapolis. Uh, that was the last team I was with. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're now the cannonballers and I, you know, I'm out in the area and I, so I went to some games and when I saw that, I was like, Oh, I got to throw on the, uh, the old so cannonballer who are they, shirt. Who are they affiliated with and what, what level are they? It's a good time, but yeah, they're still the White Sox, uh, single A affiliate for the White Sox show. Okay. They build a new stadium for them and stuff. It's pretty cool. They actually got like really um, a splash park and like a, a kids like park play area within it too. And so even when there's not games going on, <laughs> you could just go up there, grab a dog, and let the kids play around and stuff. I'll just take a look at it. Yeah, Canapolis yeah. was fun. We uh we had we had good fans. We had a good. Uh... Booster Club, as you might call it. Yeah, a lot of fun. It was a good team. Yeah, yeah it's a cool area, man. And yeah, a lot of fun. And yeah, I mean, those minor league teams, it's always a lot of fun, dude, to, to go to those. I think baseball is a lot of fun. I mean, I, you know, I, the MLB games are okay. You know, minor league baseball was, was an interesting world. And I actually went to a, a, a game in Tom's River, New Jersey. Uh, and I think now they're a double A AA or triple A affiliate. At the time, they were the high A or low A team. So we played them in Kannapolis. We were in the uh, Atlantic Coast League or whatever the hell it was. And uh, we would go to, to Tom's River, New Jersey a few times. And that was absolutely phenomenal because they built it as a double-A stadium. But they got the low-A team. But they would pack this place out. Every, like we were there every night of the week, right? So we do like a four-game stretch up there. And it'd be like, you know, Monday through Thursday or whatever it was. And they would pack it. It'd be like 8,000 people in the house. It's a really a nice, it's a nice stadium in, in uh, Tom's River. And I went back there, I guess a few years ago, I was in New York working and went to a game. And it was a ton of fun. I mean, they got outdoor seating and for all the nonsense that people say about, you know, New Jersey and East Coasters, like they're some <laughs> of the coolest, nicest people. I mean, really they packed the yeah. stadium on a Tuesday night and then the, the, they had like a club seating, uh, like a picnic seating behind the dugout or not the dugout, the, uh, the bullpen on the third base side. And the fans were the nicest people. We loved going there because their clubby, their clubhouse manager was, uh, uh, had great food. And that's another thing. Like you pay clubhouse dues everywhere you go, even in the minors. Yeah. Uh, and some people have really shitty food. Some people have really good food. He, had, he was a great clubby, had great food. But then the fans were the nicest people on earth. They would, <laughs> they would talk to us the whole game. They were super nice to us. And like I said, this place would be packed. It was so much fun. And they had like outfield seating and games. It was like a fair type thing. And they would bring us food for dinner. Like, they're like, hey, you guys hungry? Like, we'll bring you hot dogs and nachos. Like, they the best fans ever. Hey, that's um, awesome. So, I, yeah, we love Tom's River. That was a great, great venue. Um, and still is. When I went back a couple of years ago, it was a lot of fun. 
but there's there's just a different minor league is one of the few places like you go to major league baseball stadium they're all the same right yeah to some degree like you don't you forget and especially now because the the old yankee stadium's gone the old i remember going to see the, the cardinals at the, you know their old stadium in st louis that's gone so everywhere now is is like a new ballpark it all feels the same to some degree like whether they have some you know smarmy playground in the outfield or not it's it's all the same yeah. place there's not really a unique vibe anywhere minor leagues the opposite right like yeah you have the old canapolis ballpark which was like you knew where you were you could look up and you could tell very easily where you were and the fans were different and the the music was different and the air was different like everything about every little minor league baseball stadium was legitimately different right it maybe not quite the bull durham vibes but <laughs> it uh it, it was still a lot of fun because everywhere you went you didn't know what you were getting into if it was your first yeah. time there right and that was cool and i i, I do appreciate that so I, I i would tell people if you get a chance to go to a minor league baseball game go because it's oh, yeah. You know, it's cheaper. It's a lot of fun. They're unique. I mean, even like when I played in rookie ball in, in Bristol, uh, Virginia, just a totally unique affair. I mean, it was like you're in the you're in the Appalachian Mountains. It's a it's a unique little town. They love their baseball team. Like it's it's a weird world still in a good way. And there's not yeah. a lot of that left, right? Like there's some like minor league hockey that's a lot of fun, uh, but there oh, everything wow. else is. Oh, dude, minor league hockey is the best. And you know, I used to go see someone like out in San Angelo, San Angelo Texas. And it's just a blast, right? And so, but there's none of that in football. Like Major League Baseball has all become like we talk about monoculture. It's all the same now. Yeah, you know, football still has a little bit of it, you know, with the Chiefs, and there's still some cool yeah. old stadiums. And Green Bay is awesome. Green Bay, um, I mean, that's one stadium I've been to that was awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's it's it really is like you know Lambeau Field really is what they say. And yeah, same with the Chiefs. Houses lining up right outside of Lambeau to where you can like pay and park in somebody's front yard and stuff. Yeah. I mean, there, there's wow. still some cool places like that, right? Like Lambeau and Arrowhead and still some neat, neat places. Um, but those are dying. Anyway, I'm rambling on now, but yeah, baseball was a lot of fun and, and Canapolis was a, a good time. It's funny. You talk about, you said San Angelo. I, I was stationed there for, I mean, it's short as about seven months, but I, I was out there for a bit and I, I enjoyed my time in San Angelo, man. It was you know, a lot of people get you know crapped on it because it was kind of the middle of nowhere, but I, I loved it out there. Man. I had a good time. It's it's a fun place. We used to go there a lot when we were kids. We had family out in Ballinger, which is not far from San Angelo. Okay. Um, and we do we do a lot of deer hunting and dove hunting and quail and all that stuff out there. So we were out there quite a bit. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, we just hit up a random you know a good Mexican restaurant and a and a minor league uh, hockey game. Did you ever hit uh, up a uh, Lewaki Steakhouse out there? It's on the edge oh, of I, town. You know, we probably, I, I say probably did. I, mean, I imagine we did at some point. I was, yeah. you know, I would have been like, probably the last time I was there, I'd have been oh, like 11, 11 or okay. 12. Um, the last time I ever, you know, remember doing that. So I, maybe. I just remember best, it, it was just the best steak I ever had. They literally, it was like steak top, on top of a steak. It, it was like you were a steak, but it was like, it was just a pile of meat, dude. <laughs> Is awesome. it still there? I believe so. I mean, this was around 2018, and it was so it so it was so okay. good. I found out who was supplying their seasoning, and it was like a a local place that just literally yeah. had a picture of a cow on the front, and it just said steak, and that was it. And you can only order it online. They had it in a couple of stores around there, but when I moved. I had I I I since then I order it by the case and I get it sent to the really? house. So I got like eight of those bad boys sitting in there. <laughs> you need to get them as a sponsor on the show. I know, right? But the funny thing is, I don't even know if they have a damn name. <laughs> all right, well that's fair. Just steak seasoning. That's all they yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're good though. That's fair. But but yeah, yeah. I got a bunch extra. I can send you one then. But absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was out in Colorado. I was stationed out there for about nine years, and so I, I just yeah. got introduced to Colorado Eagles. Okay, and, and I loved it because I brought my buddy Tyler along, and, I, and it was getting towards the end of the game. But it was going to be the last game of the season because they were losing, and it was going to kill their season. He wanted to leave to get ahead of traffic because that's what people do a lot of games, and you're not that invested. And I was like, No, I'll just wait, just wait till the end. And sure, as shit, at the end. Just sticks, gloves, they're flying everywhere. Everybody's just beating the crap out of each other. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is what you do. Dude, that's, 
that's one hundred percent. So I love that, and that's fighting rules in every sport ought to mimic hockey. Like baseball brawls are the the worst. They're the they just <laughs> you know it's like it's like watching a bunch of peacocks go at each other, just flexing on each other. You know the dugout's clear. Like no, just yeah. let one guy go after it. Except for Nolan Ryan. Yeah, I mean, like the pitchers may be disadvantaged, so like you know you can substitute the catcher, you can tap in the catcher, but it's one one, right? It's mano a mano. And they, they have to fight each other until somebody goes down and then it's over, right? Gentlemen's rules. Yeah, you keep, it. you keep somebody from getting uh, yeah, I mean, going like, to the hospital, but you're, you know, you just handle business. Yeah, like we're not, we're not kicking everybody out. Like you might have to sit out an inning or, like, you know, sit out six outs or whatever the case may be, right? We'll come up with some rule. Yeah. But if you want to throw punches, all right, take your hits and, and then we're going to sit down for a minute and then we're going to come back. I, I think, you know, again, there's so many aspects of so many sports, especially especially what we you know you consider the uh, the mainstream American sports, which is you know baseball yeah. and football. They're just boring. I mean, it's it's dumb. It's boring. It's not. There's nothing inspiring about it. You know, I think hockey hockey is a ton of fun in person. I don't care to watch it on TV, but yeah, there's some hockey rules for sure that I think should be universal, and uh, that's one of them, right? You you get to pick a guy, throw the gloves off, to take the helmet off knock the crap out of each other and then let's let's go sit down and we'll do it again but yeah you get some other anyway. guys being a little more quiet than usual too if, if we you know if we have that in other sports too especially football. oh 100 percent. you know I, that was one of my things with baseball when i got over there i mean it, you know even in football especially you know when i was playing paid for what what you, what you said i mean at some point even within a I team right that. you gotta get in football at least yeah yeah i mean like you can run your mouth all you want but even like within a team and that's where you spend most of your time really is with 105 guys in your locker room uh you know 95 percent of your times so you're playing each other and yeah. tempers get heated there's guys it's like any team with 105 guys like you just <laughs> people don't like each other right i mean that's that's a reality of it is that you are competitive I mean, you got guys who are peak competitive peak physical condition for the, for that time and yeah. they don't like each other and so if tempers flare and you know you run your mouth enough to somebody they're going to find an opportunity at some point to make you pay for it and you're gonna and you better be ready and that's it and i mean i saw ray maluda <laughs> knock out patrick turner i mean legit knocked him out a week before our season opener because oh, they got into a little they got into a little beef and Ray was a headhunter, and that was it. I mean, he was just like, from that point on, he was like, all right, the next time you come across here and I get the chance to go out of my way to <laughs> hurt you, I'm going to hurt you, and you're probably not going to run your mouth anymore. And that was, you know, that was a world like I, let's say, grew up in. And when I got to baseball, that was gone. I was just like, I was astounded at some of the stuff you guys would say to each other. Yeah. You know, I'm just like, how do you, like, they're so cavalier with it, right? Or you would hit somebody. I remember hitting a guy, this is when I was at Kannapolis, and I, I hit some dude, and I forget who it was. It was, you know, what team he was with or whatever, but he got, you know, he was just like all up and up in arms about it. Like he was wanting to fight me. And I was just, I was like, all right, let's get this over with. Like, if we're going to fight, let's do it. But let's not run our mouths at each other the whole time. Like, you know, I'll put the yeah. glove down. You put, take the helmet off. Like, let's do this. But at, at, at just more than that, I was, yeah, he just wanted to cry about it. But I was like, more than that, I was like, bro, we're not that good. Like, calm down. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're not a good player. I'm not a good player. We're in low A ball, dude. We're not good. Like, <laughs> you should expect that. I didn't hit him on purpose. Like, I'm just not that good. You know what I mean? So that was the other thing. I was like, bro, just calm down. Like, there's there's so little room for mistakes. And there's definitely, you know, there's some there's some direct correlation between the number of pads that a guy has on his body to the ang how angry he will get if he's hit. Right? Like, if he has a show, if he's got a an elbow protector and a, and a wrist protector and an ankle protector. He's going to get super mad if he gets hit, which is, you know, uh, just tremendously I, ironic. Like, bro, you've I got, you've got like that. a body suit on. Yeah. Like <laughs> wait, watch next time. Like the guy who has the most pads is the guy who will be the most sensitive to getting hit. Makes so sense, all that to say, that was a weird um, switch going from football to baseball. But I, you know, and again, there's, there's some good rules in baseball. I, I think, but again, I think we're too sensitive. We're too quick to throw guys out. I, you know, there are some old baseball rules that I, I agree with. You know, I think I think guys should get hit more in baseball. You know, there should be like beaning dudes should be a, a much more common practice. And it and I mean hard, like get them throwing at heads. Yeah, like get them off the plate. But I mean, it's a it's an odd mixture. There's some definitely some weird shredding that goes on in MLB. And I I'd like to see them kind of loosen it up, go back to the old days. You know, chewing tobacco and and fighting each other the real way. So yeah. It's not going to, but I guess no. the best we can do is get rid of the umpires at some point. 
I, whenever I was in high school, playing ball, I sucked at, at baseball. And if I got hit, I, I was happy. I got a base, dude. <laughs> I, didn't, yeah. I didn't strike out that time. But now I might even want to lean into one every now and then, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's you know, high school baseball is fun. It's and even college baseball is fun to watch. And you know, fortunately, that's one of the places, uh, one of the areas where Arkansas has not been too bad. Yeah, um, actually, that's been the only thing I can stomach of theirs there lately. Well, that I don't watch track, but their tracks are good. So. Yeah, so we got that going on, but uh, yeah, we got that. Going on. Yeah, it's not bad. So. Yeah, I, mean, I just want to say I really appreciate you taking the time out, and, and it, was, it was really interesting. And yeah, it was it was, it was fun. I appreciate it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's so much we didn't get to hit up because we were shooting shit about everything. So yeah, definitely. Well, schedule another schedule another time, and we can get to those points. And if Matt wants to join, like, uh, good luck on flying and everything. I mean, appreciate it's it. Pretty exciting, man. Uh, so keep keep kicking ass, dude. All right, bro. You have a good one. All right, you too, dude. Later. See ya. No, sir. <laughs>